Hello everyone, Charles Watts here. Welcome back to Inside Arsenal, where I'm joined once again by James Benj of CBS Sports, which can mean only one thing. It's this week's Inside Arsenal Extra Time. And James has just come back from a big piss-up in Germany, watching Granite Xhaka lift the German Cup. How was it, mate? Oh, it was, I mean, it was brilliant. Uh, every I know it's the sort of familiar story and everyone hears it every time some English journalist goes off to Berlin, but or goes off to Germany, but the atmosphere at those games, my God, you've never seen anything like it. I mean, Kaiserslautern, uh, second tier German team, but one with like, you know, you and I will remember when they were winning titles. Mm. Um, one shot on target in the eighth minute, 10 flares go off. Uh, the, the, just the, the sending off of a uh, Leverkusen player uh, and not long after the uh, second half gets postponed for by about three minutes because they're setting off so many fireworks. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, a really great trip. It was lovely as well to, uh, and this is a sentence I've always wanted to say, catch up with Granite Xhaka at the after party um, and uh, what see a goal. Granite. What a goal. What a goal. But still not probably in his top three or four or five this season or in the last few years. Um Seeing Granite sort of so happy and at ease with himself was uh, was really nice. It was nice to catch up. Yeah, you were saying before we started recording this that you've just you've never seen him so sort of chilled and and kind of happy as he as he is right now. He's having a he's such a great swan song to his career, if you mm. can call it a swan song. I suppose it's not like he's thirty five now, but you know, it's a re- remarkable sort of second half to his career, really that that he has had at the end of Arsenal and now over in Germany. It, I mean, it, it, exactly that. I think maybe when you've gone as low as Granite has and it, it's had those moments where you've sort of wondered about, the sense I always got was wondering about, you know, whether this was the right career for you. And then he's sort of fallen back. Or it certainly seems like he's fallen back in love with the game, doesn't it? Mm. Um, and, you know, he's already t- we're already talking about the career that comes after playing. Um, I think kind of as we speak today is the final day of his UA for A license. So uh, he's back here. You he came back here, didn't he, to do it? He's back here. Yeah, back in the UK because obviously he started that coaching guys like Nuneri. Um, and you sort of look at the education he'll have had now: Arteta, Alonso, Arsene Wenger. Um, this Granite Xhaka, you know, seems like someone who would make a really, really great coach. And I have to sort of say, with the best will in the world, like. The, maybe the hot-headed guy of his 20s, you would wonder, the guy that sort of, on those good days, don't you remember, he would come into a mix zone and it would sort of be about setting the record straight. And I know there's not much of a record to set straight at Leverkusen this season, but I just think now he's a little bit more, he he would say, and certainly he's got the sense, he's more at ease, more understanding, um, and of course, enjoying life an awful lot. What well, type of manager Granite will be, as in on the touchline, how he would act? Because you talk about this hot headedness, obviously, he's still got that in him. But do you reckon, do you reckon he'll be able to keep that under control as a coach no. in the technical area? It'd be, it'd be quite fun. It would be box office stuff, I reckon, Granite in the technical area. I mean, like, it's, it, I say all these things, and there was still a moment where he was sort of grabbing an opponent uh, at chest height, wrenching them away. I think he would, yeah, he would, like you say, box office. Uh, on the touchline and um i don't know i suspect he would um he would play a sort of very possession oriented game as well don't you very controlled dominant and let's give you know his players are going to have license to shoot from range aren't they yeah it certainly are like you said though i mean you look at the managers he's worked under obviously what he'd have learned from from arsene and then then Mikel and then moving on to uh, Alonso. I mean, that's going to put you in very good stead for uh, when you do take that step into coaching, you would think. You know, he's got so much sort of different experiences from top-level coaches. Um, yeah, it's going to be really interesting. Will, will we see him back at Arsenal one day as a coach? Can you imagine <laughs> Granite, Granite the coach at the Emirates? I, I, I said to him, he'd been, obviously, credit to him, we'll wrap this up. I, I said to him, uh, you know, you've, and he said, I don't want to go back to Arsenal next season if we get them in the Champions League. And I sort of said to him, actually, you know, one, I think a lot of people at Arsenal would really like to see you back there. And I, I know before I went and I said I'd pass on these messages and I did, you know, fans saying to me, oh, if you do get to talk to Granite, make sure that you sort of say how proud Arsenal fans are. So I did pass that message on. But I said, you know, you, I think you would actually, the Emirates would love to see you again. And I think you might really love it because I think he'd get an amazing, uh, an amazing welcome. And how hard would that have been to say about five years ago? Yeah, well, I mean, just go back to the send-off he got at the end of last season. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a remarkable day, that final day. It helped by the fact he scored two goals and very nearly got a hat <laughs> I mean, that was an amazing, amazing send-off. It was just 
when you sort of cast your mind back a couple of years before that, or a few, uh, three or four years before that, it's just never in a million years would you have ever imagined Granite getting a send-off like that. But yeah, fair play to him. Brilliant win for Leverkusen. What a season, domestic season. Unbelievable. <laughs> that is genuinely, genuinely remarkable, even if they did get hammering in the um, in the Europa League final. But um, Champions League final this week. You're not going to that, are you? You're not at Wembley? I believe I am. Um, do you know what accreditation is? You know what accreditation is like for these big games. Like yeah. I, I understand I'm on the list, but I don't know where I'll be or how I'll be watching it. But somewhere in the bowels of Wembley, uh, I believe I'll be there. Very, very quickly, who wins that? Oh, Real Madrid. I'm not seeing a Dortmund shock. No. So I mean, you know, sometimes the, the thing is that I mean, yeah, Dortmund have just got kind of quite, quite lucky with bad finishing and meeting teams that just freeze under pressure haven't they like Madrid don't do that I think Real have got quite lucky I think Real have got quite lucky in it they could have easily gone out to Leipzig easily gone out to Leipzig Mm. uh, in the first knockout round I don't think they've they've done you know I don't think they've been absolutely brilliant at all to get get to the final this year they never are though are they it's just Madrid they (laughs) just they just find a way to win in this competition right let's talk about Arsenal shall we as this is uh Extra time podcast. We've got plenty to talk about today. We're going to do run through our player ratings for the season uh, a little bit later on. We've got questions and comments as always. We'll talk about some of the stuff that's doing the round. Marcus Rashford, Aaron Ramsdale. But I wanted to start today on, let's bring it up here, the striker situation at Arsenal. I think this is a really interesting debate. I was mulling over doing it on one of my regular shows, but I thought it'd be really good to sort of sit down with you and talk about this. Um, in terms of how Arsenal approach it and the decisions that Mikel Arteta has got to make when it's come to, well, not just Mikel, but Edu and and the club have to make when it comes to the striker. I think if, if we were talking about this, probably at the start of the year, just at the start of the January transfer window, we're like, what do you do for Arsenal if you're a striker, in terms of the striking department? I think we'd have been having a completely different conversation to the one we're probably going to have now in terms of what you do, because of that man in the middle of the screen here, if you're watching on YouTube, Kai Havertz, and the form that he showed in the second half of the season, having been moved to the number nine. I think it's really interesting what that move in his form has done or could do in terms of decisions Arsenal make this summer when it comes to the striker. Um, You know, do you see any way that at the start of this this coming season, Kai Havertz is not Arsenal's starting number nine? Barring the injury, o- of yeah. The only player that gives me pause to thought, but for the thought, is the one you can see on the right of the screen, Alexander Isak. And then what we're talking about is such a sort of long shot scenario of mm. Newcastle feel real pressure to sell, or Isak pushes for the move, and Arsenal get to the front of the queue. Um, and that to me seems highly unlikely so in those circumstances no I, d- I don't see a world where where Havertz isn't the number nine um at least at the start of the season because there will be someone brought in to provide competition and there will still be players like Gabby Jesus to consider as well but yeah, yeah like you say he has transformed this position he's given Arsenal things that you didn't really appreciate that they needed that ability to to hold play up to function as a 10 and a nine um you know the thing with someone like Isaac is he gives you that and the things that Gabriel Jesus gave you but what like, like you said when we were talking in January I think there was a view of like you you've just got to get the 100 million pound striker and we would talk about someone like Ossiman and be saying oh well you know do you need to worry about his his knee ish- or his his injury issues um we might be talking about Evan Ferguson because he would cost probably you know at the at the time he looked like he would cost big striker money and be like oh well you know is he definitely going to hit is he definitely going to be a elite premier league striker i think right now havertz is brilliance in the last few months gives you room to gamble a bit more gamble well, on like it basically, some... it basically allows instead of like you said sort of going all in on a big big name striker which i agree i think probably 6 months ago that was probably what arsenal were going to do we're going to we're certainly going to be seriously considering doing, but th- what this allows you to do is basically bring in a kind of I don't know project if that's the right way of describing it, but you know a potential type sign in. And I'm not talking about an 18 year old kid like a going out and bringing Jeremy Allier in from you know um, from the French Academy or whatever. I'm talking about someone like a Sesco who mm. 
is still, I would say, a sort of project type signing. Even, but he is also ready to come in and hit the ground running. And you know, he, you know, he's done it in a big league, and he can come in and immediately improve the squad and immediately start helping the team. But you can ease him in over a course of a season and things like that. And it, you know, it's not. It, I just think Havertz's form has completely changed. Will have changed Arsenal's thinking in terms of how they approach this signing this summer. I think it's really, really interesting. It's something that City do so well. Um, Rodri was brought in how long before sort of Fernandinho dropped off the off the eleven? Maybe it was only one year, but a little while before. Um, and no one necessarily thought Rodri was a surefire thing, but people were very confident. You know, people were confident. Yeah. Maybe more confident than you would be in Sesco. I mean, Alvarez would be the other example as well, wouldn't he? Someone that, that came in as a probable hit, but like you say, not someone that you would immediately chuck the number nine shirt to and say you're leading the line but someone that right now you know if City were to to lose maybe you know if City were to be without Haaland he'd have no worries with Alvarez and one day if Haaland leaves Alvarez is probably the man to lead the line for them um the joy of that is we, we talk and we've because we know that Arsenal really likes Esco he's the sort of one that gets kind of the whole label on him but you know when you're scouring the market you can find more Sesco's more mm. players with upside and potential that haven't necessarily, um, you know, gone all the way yet than you can Isaacs and Ossimens. And yeah. if you make a mistake on Sesco or you make a mistake on whoever that young striker is, you, you've got wiggle room there. You know, even with Arsenal's Champions League uh, money, if they messed up the 100 million man striker, it would be really, really hard to make up for that. Mm. Do you see a 20 goal a season striker in Havertz? And do Arsenal need a 20 goal a season striker? I think it's really like everyone said we need 25 goals a season striker, stuff like that. But we've said that the last two seasons, Arsenal scored, I think, 91 goals and 89 goals or something like that over the last two seasons. So goal scoring hasn't actually been a problem despite not having that that man. It would help 100%. But do you see, I mean, I think Havertz got 10 goals in the second half of the season, mm -hmm. having made that move to. The, um, to the number nine position. Can you see with this sort of confidence he's got and the rhythm that he's got now that he could, if he played that role for the entire season with a Sesco or a, a Xerxy or I, I don't know, one, you know, another that mm -hmm. type of signing brought in to, to help him and Gabriel Jesus, of course. Um, can you see him being a 20 goal a season striker? And if he's not, do you think that really, really matters? C can you? Well, if he keeps up the scoring rate that he showed in the second mm -hmm. half season, yes. But it's just like, can he do that? I suppose that's the big question mark over it. Like, can he? Was that just a real hot streak for him? Yeah. Or, or can he? Can he maintain that, or even improve on that? My suspicion is hot streak, but we do. Even now that he's sort of in great form, I think we forget sort of what we thought peak Havertz might be before he moved to Chelsea. And I, and I think we sort of are still viewing him a little bit through a prism of those final few years in Chelsea because he had a great first season and that first six months at Arsenal. I, I think the answer is probably not because, I mean, 20 is a lot of goals, isn't it? That's more than Ollie Watkins got. Um, but, I mean, top five scorer in the league would be absolutely more than happy with that from centre forward. Let City be the team that has Erling Haaland score uh a quarter of their goals and that might work for city but actually most teams that are incredibly reliant on you know the golden boot winner there's no real correlation between golden boot winner and, and title and i think as long as saka erdegaard are weighing in with the goals they did trossard if you get martinelli back to anything like the player he was the season mm. before like, are we calling it last season yet i think last we can. Season, yeah. yeah the season before last if you get them back to that level then it just it doesn't matter. And there's goals in this team across the team. And actually, I think, again, City are an imperfect, uh, City are an imperfect example. I, I use Villa or Spurs when Harry Kane got injured. You know, these teams can really falter if they lose their star number nine. Um, there are positions where you could say Arsenal would falter as well. But actually, I think have, losing a striker tends to happen more than most. They get kicked about a lot, especially, you know, your Jesus's and your Havertz. So it's, I think it's quite important you can weather that storm and not be reliant on any one player for a third of your goals in a season. So it doesn't worry me. Um, and I'd rather take the punt that 
that Acesco could be that 20 goal a season striker in the near term. Yeah, I think it's very good to be able to not throw someone straight into the mix who are coming in from abroad and thinking you've got to, you know, you have to be our number nine, you have to hit the ground running, you have to score goals straight away or we're screwed. I think it's, you're in a very good position if you can ease someone in over over six months or even a season, really, especially if they're a young player. Mm-hmm. What you're talking about there is quite an interesting question, actually. Hold on one sec. From my sour sauce, he says, hi, Charles and Benj. Massive, oh. fan of, massive fan of the show and your work. How much stock do you think Arteta and the coaching staff put in players that we feel can deliver more? For example, we have had an ongoing frenzy searching for a striker, but if we could by some miracle regain the former 2022-23 Jesus and Martinelli, our attack is immediately one of the most dangerous in the league, and that is on top of this season's record-breaking result thoughts. And you you know, Mikel always says it, and managers always say it, isn't it? It's like my first thought are about improving mm-hmm. the players we have. And he always says that sort of stuff when you talk about transfers. But I mean, it is absolutely, you know, of course you want to sign new players, you want to keep improving the squad. But you also, it's just as important. When you've got a player like Gabriel Jesus, who if you can get back to that 2022, 23, I wouldn't say form, I'd just say fitness, because I think that's the main Mm. thing. If he gets back to that fitness, then the form's just going to come because he's that good a player. And the same as with maybe Martinelli's more of a confidence thing than anything else at the moment, I think, with him. But you get those two players back firing the way that we know they can fire, then this Arsenal attack, as my South Source says, it just changes completely, doesn't it? It improves massively if you can do that. So I think he'd put an awful lot of stock into that this summer. Absolutely. Especially because they're two players he he absolutely loves. Remember when people thought that, that Mikel Arteta didn't like Gabriel Martinelli? Yeah. Oh, times have changed. Yeah. I mean, the Martinelli one especially seems quite explicable i mean even in this season you know there were times when the goals weren't going in but it was only sort of in the latter weeks of the season when injury had just slowed him down that we really saw it sort of taper off quite a bit and he still had brilliant games i know sheffield united are hardly the hardest test in the league but tore them to pieces um had some great cameos off the bench as well quite good champions league game so i don't see really any fear with that one because it just seems like quite a known quantity. He just had an off year. Um, he might not all... He had an incredible on year the year before. He also, Jesus, had, he also was littered with injuries this season. Every yeah, exactly. time he started coming back, he'd get another injury. And you know, that just doesn't help with any player. Yeah. I mean, the one thing you'd sort of start to say, we don't think about it in terms of Martinelli, but sort of his career's getting a bit pockmarked with injuries, isn't it? It's, you know, 21-22... Well, no, 22-23 is now looking a bit like the outlier in terms of fitness. Mm-hmm. Just, gets a, just a lot of, thought. Gets a lot of kicks, though, doesn't he? Gets a lot of kicks. A lot of kicks. Credit to anyone that, that can keep up with him to kick him. That's what yeah. I say. Um, Jay Zuso, again, it's the same injury thing. And, I mean, that's one where we have to sort of acknowledge right now that we're in the dark about yeah. the state of Gabriel Jesus' knee. Because if that keep it that keeps playing up, and if that's fixable, then I completely agree with what my sad source says. This is going to be one of the best attacks in the league because Jesus, Havertz, Drossard, all those guys rotating fully fresh whenever they come into the attack. That sounds great. Yeah. Uh, but you know, Gabriel Jesus's knee is the great unknown at Arsenal right now. I think. But they will know, won't they? You know, obviously yeah, we're know. we're in the dark, yes, but they're, and they're not very keen to talk about. It, but they will know. So I think they they will certainly have a very good idea about whether they could get they can get him back to that sort of fitness and, and what they need to do with him this summer. And like you said, if you get you know if they if they're very very confident that they can sort out this issue once and for all and that it will be fine for the start of the season, then you've got Havertz there as well. Again, that just eases the pressure going back to you know a sort of the decision that they've got to face in them when it comes to bringing in this new man, it eases the pressure on going out and having to buy your 120 million pound player or 200 million as Newcastle seem to be asking for, for <laughs> retack while, while balking at Arsenal's 30 million valuation for Aaron Ramsdale. Um, it just eases the pressure. And again, it allows you more to think, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to spend some of our money on more of a project type signing than a absolute world beat a number nine. And, Yes, yeah, so I think Havertz and Jesus are so, so key to that decision, 100%. It's sort of sitting here right now. What, what would you expect at the start of next season? What sort of striker do you think comes in? Um, I, I, I think probably not just a Sesco type. I think probably Sesco. Mm-hmm. 
it wouldn't shock me. I mean, like kind of it almost as we're, we're putting all this together as well. When we talk about Jesus and you know, he, what he could be like if his knee comes together, it, I wouldn't say it's totally unimaginable that like, you know, you, you almost get your project striker, but he doesn't play for Arsenal this season. Goes out on loan. Speculation. I, I see sometimes my things get aggregated. So that is speculation, not reporting. Um, I mean, it wouldn't be a mad idea as well. Like, if I don't you know. think, I think, I think they, a, need, they need, another, they do need something. Yeah, I think they need something else. We, yeah, I just can't. I can't imagine you're going to spend some money. I'm not sure Arsenal are in a position where they can spend some money and then send that signing Saliba like straight back out on on loan again. Good, um, it was a good move that one. It was a good move. That anyway. would have to be like a, a a cheaper option, wouldn't it? Someone at the sort of twenty five thirty range. I think you could justify doing that, couldn't you? And say maybe yeah. in the Bundesliga. I just think Arsenal need need another need another addition, and I think it's more of another sort of yeah. Whether it's Sesko or not, we should find out pretty soon in, in terms of what's you know if Sesko is going to be on the market or mm. not, or if he's going to sign a new contract. It sounds like that will be a decision that we take him pr pretty rapidly. Um, you know, Leipzig we know are pretty keen, understandably, to get him to get him tied down. Um, so we'll find out a little bit more on that. But yeah, I, th I think a, a Sesko type player. I think you, you try and maybe bring in someone's very similar in attributes to to Havertz and have that other option up front and um yeah and then the big money or bigger money is spent maybe on a ready main ready made central midfielder to come in and make that big impact straight straight away you want a winger as well yeah do you do you sign a striker and a winger in the same window do you think is that realistic because i think we're, they're definitely going to sign a midfielder really. aren't they they're definitely yeah. going to sign a midfielder and they're definitely going to sign a goalkeeper so yeah, and, and they're definitely I would, I would also be, I would be willing to grit my teeth and not get a, a defender. I mean, you don't have to get a defender uh, if it meant getting, again, sort of low price point but interesting winger. Yeah, I mean, I would. Love, I think they do need to get a winger, one hundred percent. I like you. I would. I would get a winger over a defender. I think they've. <laughs> They might need a little bit of luck in terms of injuries, mm. but if everyone stays injury free, or maybe not even everyone, if the vast majority stay injury free for the, I think they've got enough defensively. But they do desperately need another winger. I, I, I think you know, and you know, yeah, a Michael Elise. I'd love Michael Elise. <laughs> Someone and Elise can stay fit anyway. I would absolutely mm. love someone like that. But the thing is, you, you're talking such big money. Then if you sign a striker, a winger, a midfielder. A goalkeeper. I mean, you're talking another two hundred million pound summer window, really two hundred million pound plus summer window. Come on, Stan, yeah. get your wallet out. Come on, Edu, make some sales. <laughs> oh no! Well, that's going to be a rough summer, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Right, let's uh, let's move on. Actually, what, what were your thoughts on um, on the Marcus Rashford stuff? <laughs> what do you immediately think about Rashford and Arsenal? Um, We're talking about a winger and a forward, I suppose. Someone who can play in both positions, there's, there's he can certainly do that. Yeah, I knew we were going to talk about this. So here are his non-penalty expected goals per 90 in the Premier League. That this, um, season, this season just gone, or the, overall? For the last, let's do the last four seasons. A really good, I mean, like, you know, it's in many ways it's much the same as, um, you know, as, as what we'd consider good goal output. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a non penalty XG every other game. That's top, top, top. Really pleased with that. So 2020, 21, 0 0.28 per 90. 21, 22, 0 0.21 per 90. 22, 23, 0 0.48. 23, 24, 0 0.23. He's create a bit as well, although in the year that he got all those goals, the creative numbers went down. And you can talk to me about anyone would look better just not playing in that Manchester United team. I could be talked into that. You know, the one year that they were organised, he did great things. But 300 grand a week, uh, he turns 27 quite soon. Um, I wouldn't do that for a transfer fee. I wouldn't pay money for Rashford. And they, it would, have to, they would have to be yeah, exactly. as well. It'd have to be a, a transfer fee that, you know, new ownership can justify why they've sold the local lad come good to why they've done a reverse van Persie. I mean, you know, 
Manchester United have never sold their stars to Arsenal, at least not in my lifetime. Mm. Um, well, Mikel so Silvestre, I... how dare you? <laughs> God, I, sorry, I, I should not even mention that name. Oh, okay. it, it, it sends shivers down my spine. Mikel Silvestre, genuinely still the worst player I've ever seen play for Arsenal. And I've seen, I've seen Igor Stepanos play for Arsenal. <laughs> Stepanos was quite good. He gets. Oh no, he wasn't. <laughs> no, it's harsh. Um, I yeah, I just on Silvestre. He's one of the sort of half dozen. You know, nowadays in our inboxes, you get all these sort of quotes from. Uh, betting company yeah 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 and something you like we spoke to this and if you send me quotes with um Mikel with, with some players I'll just ignore them I you know I don't really care what um William Gallas no well that I was gonna say the two I would block your email address for are William Gallas and Mikel Silvestre yeah, I have absolutely. no interest in what they have to say about Arsenal absolutely none don't want to yeah. hear it so I, I'm guessing Rashford is a, is a pretty hard no from you hard no Oh, yeah, man. I agree. I agree. And you know, people saying, "Oh, well, look, look what Mikel has done with Havertz and turn turn that round." I do think there's differences with the two. I think I would I would have no confidence that you could turn around Rashford. I think making a move from Manchester to London would be massive for him. He's a Manchester boy. You know how he'd handle that. He's a one club man as well so far. So this would be his first time moving away. Havertz had had experience coming from a different country to a new club. And then, so uh, I think that would help with the move. I think Rashford, mm. it'd be a massive thing moving from Manchester to London. And like you said, the money, just the money is the main thing as well. It'd be a transfer fee. The wages are huge. Back, every back page, which you don't quite get with Havertz because it's not an England international. Yeah. You know, Rashford would be on every back page for six months. 100%. Yeah. It's a, it's a definitely a no for me that one i think if you're going to spend that sort of money and pay those sort of wages there's there's definitely a lot of other ways that you probably should be going in that in that point right let's do this then shall we now have the arsenal squad list up if you're watching on youtube you can see it if you don't if you're listening on podcast i've got the arsenal squad list up for the season just gone and we are going to go through the majority of them maybe going to take carl hine out of that but other than no. that just oh and you're in timber obviously because he didn't play um so take out those two players and we will go through and give our quick player ratings. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, um, but we'll go we through. We do have to be clear on one thing, though. What's that? What is the starting point? Is it five or six? The great player rating debate. Do you start on a six or a five? I start on a six. Okay. I'll start, start on a six too then. I would start okay. on a five, but, you know, it's your show. So six, six is it's average. Five. Yeah. Yeah. It's wrong, okay. isn't it? When, even as you're saying that, you realise that what you're saying is wrong, but you're used I'm to it. I'm quite to harsh on my ratings, though. Like everyone, okay. everyone slags me off on, in the comments whenever I do my player ratings <laughs> after a game. Everyone's saying you're too harsh. It's far too harsh. But you know, I always sort of start on six and say that's a good game. That's a decent enough game mm. if you got a six. Um, you know, you've done nothing wrong there. And so seven, I seven for me, I think. So you've that's a decent performance. Mm. Um, but so yeah, six. I think is there any on oh, Mohamed or Nenny? We're not going to rate Mo. There's no point rating Mo, is there? I don't think. Not ten really play ten for off field though. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Ten out of ten for cheerleading. Yeah. I'm brilliant at that. Okay, right. Let's start no with David Raya. Right. David Raya. Then I know you're going to go very high with with David Raya. So uh, what's your season rating for David Raya? David Raya's an eight. Yes, I agree. I'm giving him an eight as well. Golden Glove changed the way Arsenal play. I think absolutely. And um, yeah, after survived that really sort of difficult spell early on, came through it really, really well. And um, yeah, was was excellent. Anything to add? No, nothing to add. And if we're going to do these rapid fire, I feel like there might be ones to debate a bit more. All right. Ramsdale. Four. Four? I... What's he done wrong? What's he done right? And then there've been some things he's done wrong. I think four. Maybe oh. a five. I, I'm I'm going. I'm going five. I'm going six. Oh, he's, because he, when he's played, he's done what he needed to do, hasn't he? I there don't, have I don't been think some, there have been think... some errors. Yeah, but there's errors for David Raya as well. There's just there was yeah. more games for Raya to make up for those errors. Um, yeah, that's true. No, I'm sticking with a six. Right, you're giving him a five. I'm going with a six. There you go. Okay, William Saliba, nine. Uh, yes, I agree. I'm surprised you've gone higher for Saliba than Raya. I thought Raya would be right up there. I'm surprised for you. Yeah, I, I, I kind of. I, I think when, whenever we did that Player of the Season award, David Raya must have had an amazing game beforehand because that was just stupid to put him in the top five. Almost as stupid as saying Crystal Palace going to get top four. 
Uh, I still believe. Still looking forward to that fifty pounds that I'm definitely going to remind <laughs> you about at the end of the season. So William Saliba nine, yeah, I'm sticking with that. I'm going with nine as well for Saliba. I don't think you can really. I mean, it's just been unbelievable. So, uh, so yeah, nine. Ben White, nine. See, I'm going with an eight for White. I'm, oh I'm, I'm no, not sure he didn't quite. quite. Yeah, he he had a bit of a mixed middle part of the season. Dubai obviously mm. recharged his batteries, recharged his tan, came back as a Ben White we all know and love. But just, just. I, I'm not sure I can give him the same rating as Saliba, if you mm-hmm. see what I mean. He's been brilliant, but I think he'd be, you know, if we were doing point fives, he'd be an eight point five, but we're not. Yeah. We're doing round up, so I'm going to give him. I'm going to give him an eight, um, and I'm going to give Gabriel a nine. Absolutely. I mean, the guy that sh- tells you ev- shows you everything great about where Arsenal have been over the last three or four years. Um, you know, thank thank God that Saudi offer never did actually drop on Edu's desk. Yeah, and hopefully it doesn't again this summer. Uh, you're in Timber, not going to give him a mark. Uh, hopefully, looking forward to him getting a nine next season. Jakob Kivior. Hmm. I mean, like, look, there were there were tough times, but even they get the sort of mitigating thing of he's a young guy playing out of position in a new league. Um, was bought at a nice price, and I think he'll probably stay. But if he went, he would make Arsenal good money. Um, I think a seven. Yeah, uh, but seven. Like you know. Yeah, that was that was a number I had in my head. It's seven, but I think he's had a good season. Kivio, I think he's come on a long way. And um, like you said, some difficult times playing at left back, but uh, also some very good times as well. And, um, yeah, he's shown he's got plenty about him. Give him a seven. Cedric, not going to mark. Tommy Asu. Ten, ten, for the, ten for the farewell tweets, though. thought they were good. Yes. Yes, he's just done his uh, podcast with Pedro Pinto, isn't he? I saw some quotes going around for him today talking about... Uh, so it was some quite good stuff, actually. Talking about how uh, people like Saka have sort of transformed in front of his eyes over the last four years. And uh, Yeah, hopefully he gets himself a good club and have a nice end to his career. Tommy Asu. Um, an eight for performances, but... Do I have to mark him down one because he's so infrequently available? No, I, I I suppose you're giving season ratings probably based more on performances and availability, isn't it? Although, yeah, I suppose you need to work out how many games they've played. I've got it's, seven in my head for Tommy now. Yeah. I, I, it is that thing of just like when he plays, he's an eight, but I just just need him to be there more. Yeah. Um, yeah. You have to factor it in a little bit. So we both go in with a seven for that? Yeah. Sorry. Zinchenko. Like, I think there would be some people that would sort of say he achieved what they expected because their expectations were lower for his than than mine were. Um, and I still thought, even when Arteta sort of, you know, even for all the issues, when Arteta started the season with Timber at left back, I still thought, oh, he's going to come back to Zinchenko in the end. It's not quite been there, though, has it? I can't quite put my finger on what he's not done in possession, but maybe some of the passing hasn't been quite as precise. There haven't been quite as many assists. Maybe all that's because he's in and out of the team. So I'll go five. Yeah, I'm. I was sort of hovering between six and five, Sinchenko. I don't think he's been bad, as a lot of people have said he's been in the last season. I think he's became a little bit of a whipping boy at time, which I feel feel was mm. harsh. I do think that Arsenal. I think he's definitely struggled at, at times. I think confidence got on, uh, has got the better of him at times. Well, I think the way Arsenal have played has changed a little bit as well. And um, that he's not the sort of positives that he has always outweighed the negatives. But I think we started to see the negatives started to potentially outweigh the positives at times this mm. season. I think five, I think I'm, I was thinking six, but I think it's probably going to be five because if six is average, I think for him, Certainly, my expectations for him this season, what how important I thought it was going to be, I think he's probably just dipped below that. So yeah, I'm probably going to say five as Inchenko. Yeah, I think uh, if a right. youth, if a, if someone came in as a youth team, if Arsenal had their own sort of Rico Lewis equivalent, I might give these performances a seven because, but it's Inchenko. You know, he was one of Arsenal's most important players last season, and I think you have to judge him against that level. Yeah. Well, I think the fact that he barely played during the running, it just yeah. kind of absolutely highlighted how off it he was. You know, this is a player that Mikel Arteta absolutely loves. And like you said, was one of the name, first names on the team sheet. And then during the running, he was barely used. And I think that, that says a lot in terms of his season. Thomas Partey. 
Uh, it's, guys, tough, tough to mark. But six. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's barely but played again. If we're going to knock points off for uh, unavailability for Tommy mm. Asu, then, you know, party's basically not, you're basically rating him on five games, the final five games of the season, pretty much, aren't we? And those were sort of games that were, could go between an eight and a four. Yeah, quite, wasn't it? often within the same game. Yeah, absolutely. I was. Um, I think. Oh, yeah, I, I, mean, I, I get, thinking I get six, accused of hating five. on Thomas Party so much in the comments on these, and it's like <laughs> it couldn't be further from the truth. You know, I think he's a fantastic footballer, and I'm desperate to see him at his best. But um, yeah, he's definitely. He's just. It's been a really disappointing season from Thomas mm. because of injuries. Yeah, not because of his performances, just because of injuries. So it's. I don't, I'm not sure I can give him a six because he's just. He's not been available. And it's not his fault. <laughs> But he's not been available. So I think in terms of expectations for the season, if six is average, I think it's got to be five for Thomas. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. But that is purely down to availability before all the haters jump in the comments again. So <laughs> well, they will anyway. Desperate to desperate to sell Thomas Party. It's like I'm not at all. I absolutely am not. And there's plenty like, of other people who would like to like to report that Thomas Partey's already gone. Yeah, I, absolutely. But uh Thomas Party's certainly not in that uh in, in not not on the same page when it comes to that as far as i'm aware um, indeed very yeah. much so right martin odegaard <laughs> oh nine don't want to give out too many tens nine. I'm, not giving out, I'm not giving out a 10 at all you're not giving out uh, a single 10 no sad that no um, nine well he's yeah. obviously nine with a bullet isn't he yeah, Martin Odegaard, nine, absolutely. What, what season, what player. Fantastic. Uh, Emil Smith-Rowe. So for him, it's not actually... You can't sort of mark him down for availability because no, he has been actually available. been available. Yeah. He's just not been picked. Um, so I suppose you have to factor in there's a reason he's not being picked, um, which obviously we're not privy to all of, but we are privy to some of. Uh, six, because when he has played, he's played well. He could easily finish with five or six goals this season, easily. Mm -hmm. When you look at the chances he's had this season in the rare amount of minutes he's played, which shows how good he is at popping up in positions to create problems because in the very, in the few, I don't even know how many minutes he played over the combination of the season, but it wasn't huge. And he could have easily, even at the end of the season, the, the game against Everton, he hit the bar and yeah. um, he's just always pops up in those areas. But yeah, I mean, it's been a disappointing season, no doubt about it. Not in terms of performances, just once again, in terms of game time. And like you said, it's not because he's really had injury issues. There's been a couple of annoying ones that have happened at annoying times. But um, yeah, I'd say five or a six for Emil. Again, what would I give him? I think I'd probably say five. But again, that's not down to his performances. It's more down to just, you know, when he's played, he's played well. You know, his last mm. start, he was man of the match in the Premier League. So he played well, but... Uh, just wasn't wasn't given any game time, so I'd probably give him a five. Jorginho, I'm going seven for Jorginho. Some a excellent performances when needed. Some big games over some key moments of the season. Didn't let anyone down. Um, yeah, seven for me. My immediate view was eight because um, when he when he was good, he was so good. Mm. But that actually, like in the span of the season, the sort of Jorginho run of games is probably what December to February. Yeah. So there's a lot of this. I mean, he's certainly better than I expected. But yeah, I think maybe I'll fall down on a on a seven as well. Mm -hmm. Can we mark Fabio Vieira? I think we probably can. Wasn't great when he did play, did it? Was he? He had a good start, didn't he? He sort of got himself yeah. into the team and then got the, sent off, and then the injury at pretty much the same time, and then was out. We well, basically didn't see him again for the rest of the season. <laughs> so, um, yeah, five. I think five. Yeah. yeah. Mo won't mark Kai Havertz. This will be an interesting one. Kai Havertz season rating. Yeah, you can't forget even the two halves, isn't it? Yeah, definition of. But again, when I sort of say like I've got to judge Zinchenko by the standards he set, I've sort of got to judge Havertz by my initial expectations for him. So I will go eight because yeah. uh, it blew the door off them in the end. That's the number I've got in my head. I absolutely blew the. Uh, blew the roof off my expectations for him when he when he arrived and certainly what I saw for the first couple of couple of months. So yeah, eight for me. Declan Rice, so here's your ten, no mm -hmm. doubt. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I'm giving it a nine. I'm giving it a nine, but I, I I have no issue with you giving him a ten. Just a brilliant debut season. Just can't really ask for any more than that, can we? Everything. Made Arsenal better defensively, made them better in attack. Um 
made himself so much better in almost everything he does uh, and has brought real character to to the club. Um, yeah, brilliant. What a signing. This will be an interesting one, Bukaya Saka. Oh, nine. I know it's been sort of peaks and troughs a bit more this season than last, but those peaks have been really high. I think he's a nine as well. I, th- I think Saka's season's been absolutely underrated by a lot of people. I, I think yeah, I think he's still had a really, mm. really good season. His numbers are fantastic, which is best ever numbers, isn't it? He's exceeded yeah. any other season in this season. This is one where you say he have not always been at his best. and Just gets booted around constantly, gets up, keeps going. If he's not scoring, he's producing real big moments, key passes to to set up goals. So yeah, I'm giving I'm giving him a nine. Gabriel Jesus, five again. Of issue, I mean, I could even be talked into a four, but I think a five because there've been some really good games. Yeah. Champions League. Uh, he basically won the the Forest away. It was the away yeah, Forest away game. Away, yeah. He won that on his own. Um, so a five. I just you just know there's a better version of Gabriel Jesus that we only saw in in flashes. Yeah, I agree. Five for me, Gabriel Martinelli. I'm probably going. I'm probably going one up. I'm probably going a six. If I'm giving Jesus a five, I'm probably giving Martinelli a six. I think. Yeah, I know what you mean. Then that it feels unfair to bracket. What are their final numbers? He's got six goals, four assists. It's a lot down though in yeah, really. two thousand minutes. Maybe I'm, I'm going to have to give him a five as well. Yeah, maybe I will give him a five. Maybe it's probably very similar to Jesus' season, really. Yeah. Funny thing yeah. is, he was getting in better positions like all season long. He's the, the underlying numbers are the same, which is going back to what I was saying about Martinelli earlier. It's why you don't need to worry too much. No. It's just he's had a bad finishing season. And that's why I'm talking about confidence for him. I think that's a really key, just rebuilding that confidence a little bit. If he, a confident Martinelli scores at least another four or five goals during the final couple of months of the season than, than he did when you look at someone who misses the chances that he missed. Yeah. Um, Eddie, this is another sort of season is too harsh. Basically, <laughs> basically Fulham away killed him. <laughs> we basically never saw him again after Fulham away on, a, <laughs> on New Year's Eve. I've got no memory of anything Eddie and Ketia did after. I don't even have much memory of anything he did after that goal against Forest, but I really like that goal against Forest. So five. Well, he scored that brilliant hat trick, didn't he? Against. Oh, I can't remember who it was against. Uh, was, it, was it Sheffield United at home? The one where he bet the hat trick was, was it like Sheffield United, United on home? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, he started the season pretty well. He's, I think he, he scored did. Sort of five or six I, goals, hadn't he? But then, yeah, he got I'm to the second harsh, half of the I? season and. Um, yeah, just couldn't couldn't maintain it. I think Arsenal's level had gone up to such a standard that you sort of it was pretty clear that they'd gone beyond Eddie the way they were playing in that second half of the yeah. season. It was just it was too much for Eddie to come on and be able to play at that sort of standard and that sort of level, which is no slight against him. He's just Arsenal are clearly well above now the uh, Eddie he's at Palace, level. Though. Top huh? three when he's at when in, and he's at Palace firing that top four bid. You'll regret. He's going, to, he's going to earn you your 50 quid, is he? Eddie and Kessie is going to fly you your he 50 will. pounds. Okay. So what are we giving Eddie? Five? Five. Leo? I'm going to say eight. Eight is eight for me, yeah. Second top scorer. Only Saka scored more. 17 mm-hmm. goals. Big goals as well in really crucial moments. Big but goals. But did float in and out of games more than anyone, I think. You'd have a, like a 40 minutes where you'd barely see Leo involved and then he'd pop up with a really important goal and um, obviously take a lot of the headlines. But um, if I'm giving Saka a nine, I, th- I think an eight for Leo is, is, is right. It reminds me a little of early years Carnu. Not, not you know, Invincibles era Carnu where it's just nice to have him around. Just, you know, had a, never, you would never sort of, he would, he would always sort of end up with about 20 starts that you'd never quite notice where they came from. Mm. Um, scored big goals against big opponents. I know the other one's Jungberg, but I was like, everyone says he reminds me of Jungberg. Um, technically, in no way does he remind me of Carnu. Um, and obviously, they're quite different shape-wise as well. <laughs> one tall, languid striker. One is just a sort of little dynamo. But yeah, he's got that Carnu-ish quality. Mm-hmm. Cool. And then finally, Reese Nelson. 
That's got me a five, five, five or four for Reese. He's just not really done anything this season, has he? And I think the challenge would be one. We know Arteta does really admire the talent of of Nelson. He always says that more than he does with a lot of other players. Mm. Um, and we know that Arsenal have needed someone with some of Nelson's qualities. And you know Arteta won't be blind to that. And yet he's still not getting the game time. Kind of does say quite a bit about where Nelson is, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I just think, and this is similar to what I was talking about with Eddie, I think Arsenal now are just at that level where two or three years ago, these guys are in the squad and they were kind of Arsenal's level and they could come on and mm. it wouldn't lower the, thing, lower the standards of the team too much. But I think now the standards that Arsenal are setting, you know, 89 points in a Premier League, 28 wins out of 38 in a Premier League, that's such a high standard. Yeah. That those sort of players who were around a few years ago and it kind of were of that level, I just think now the standard's so high that it's just, the drop off when they come in is so vast, and that's not against them. It's nothing against them and their quality. I just think that Arsenal have moved on to another level now, and those sort of players are just struggle to be able to maintain that level when when they come in. So there you go. There's our uh, there's our end of season player ratings. I'm sure lots of you are going to disagree, and you'll get in the comments and tell us exactly why we're wrong. And uh, by all means, do that. Get into the comments and reply. Right, quickly before we move on, to some questions and comments. Do you see this? Mikel got his award I did. at the Globe Smart Soccer Awards. Well. Premier League manager at the Globe Soccer Awards. Not sure how we can get that award, I have to say. And I'm, look, I'm a very big Mikel Arteta fan, big fan of what he's doing at Arsenal, but I'm not sure how... Do you think daishi has been robbed? No, I agree. Absolutely, Daish, Daish has been robbed. Not Someone mention, called 999. Not to mention for Guardiola and potentially Unai Emery, to be, to be fair. Um, but yeah, he was speaking about it. Did you see he did it? He sort of repeated the don't be satisfied line and he was... Um, it was like win, yeah, win, win. Much. When they said, "What do you do next?" It's like win, win, win. And um, um, said, we've been building for a few years, and right now we have a team that's full of enthusiasm and so hungry to win trophies. We know the competition, but we believe we can do it. So we're going to give it a real go. Um, Cesc looked very happy, handed it, handed that trophy over to him on the awards yesterday. On the subject of future Arsenal managers, just got well, he hasn't he hasn't quite got Como promoted, but he has because he's done it while he's not had his correct licenses. Mm -hmm. Bring him in. Get him on staff. No, not for me. Oh. Not for me. Love Sesk as a player. He was brilliant. One of the best young players I've seen, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm ready to... Uh, Forgive. To, uh, yeah. And yeah, not sure. Not sure for me. Um, but yeah, he's done brilliant over in Italy. Fair play to him on that. Do you see Aaron Ramsdale in the uh, Community Shield crowd? If you haven't, there he is. Dressed as Hagrid from Harry Potter. Do we have any idea why he's dressed as Hagrid? Other than obviously, if he's dressed as Aaron Ramsdale, he's he either getting was there in support or... of David Brooks. And each year, like one of him and his group of mates includes Brooks and a couple other players from that Sheffield United team. If they get to a Wembley, they all go and support their mate and they all go dressed up. So this is the third year he's done it. The first year, I can't remember who he went as. The second year, they all went as wrestlers. And this oh, year, right up your street. This year, because he, he was talking to Sky Sports yesterday, and he explained this. This year, they were they were deciding between going as Toy Story characters or wizards, and they decided to go as a uh, wizards and Harry Potter theme, as you can see by the guy next to him, who's just actually in that case, Aaron. If you're watching, you've failed the assignment because Rubius Hagrid is not a wizard, uh, and a he school. explained that as well. He said, but because oh, I was going at it, he was just like, oh, um, who who else can I really go as? And he was like, oh, sorry, I'm just going to go as Hagrid, even though that's kind of not <laughs> an actual wizard. Uh, I would yeah. definitely have done Toy Story. Who would you have I mean, gone? Can you imagine walking up Wembley Way dressed as Buzz Lightyear? So cool. <laughs> yeah, it would be pretty cool. Um, what do you make of the stuff about Ramsdale and um, Newcastle and the value, the fact that they're apparently balking at the idea of playing paying thirty million for Aaron Ramsdale? And I've spoken about this in, my, in the shows this week. I just don't know what. It's a tough one for Arsenal because I just think the transfer fee clubs are going to know the position they're in. They know they want to sell, but then I also and people have pointed this out to me. They're like, well, so what if you? you if people if play people are playing hardball with evaluation, then you just don't sell because mm. at the end of the day, they're gonna if they're if they're seriously gonna offer like only 15 million for Ramsdale, then and they're not gonna do it, then they're gonna have to get out and go and sign another goalkeeper who potentially like James Trafford's been linked, and there's something yeah. like 20, 25 million for James Trafford. If you're gonna sign a goalkeeper and you've got 25 million to spend, who would you rather sign? James Trafford or Aaron Ramsdale? 
Oh, it's not even up for debate, is it? Exactly. I, so, I, I like James Trafford. He seems good, but one of them's yeah. a sure thing. Same with the guy from Valencia, who apparently very good, but Ramsdale ticks an awful lot of boxes. So as much as these clubs right now are saying, oh, Arsenal are in a bad position, they're going to have to sell, we don't want to, we're going to lowball them. At some point, if Arsenal stand firm, that club's going to have to make a decision on spending a certain amount of money on a goalkeeper. And surely the value for money, even if it goes to 25 million, the best goalkeeper out there right now for 25, 30 million, Ravdell's got to be right at the top of their list. So I, I just don't see how Arsenal can consider selling for anything less than they signed him for. I really don't. And I think it sets a bad precedent. Awful. When you come to sell, it's within this window in particular, when you're looking at cashing in on academy graduates, um, all of whom at the moment, I mean, you know, varies a bit on maybe someone like Smith Rowe. How many years has Eddie got left? Three. Two or three, I'm not sure. So two or Emil's, three. Emil's two, isn't he? Yeah. So Smith Rowe aside, you don't have to sell these players if you're not going to get good money for them and if selling them means you're going to get less money for the rest when they come to be sold i mean it's it's interesting seeing the sort of stories leaking out from what would appear to be the newcastle side of negotiations talk about arsenal's ffp worries which no um i mean the reality is that there's obviously a price that newcastle can afford to go to and it but 30 million is is I will, I'm sure would probably be within that especially if they want to you know get a, a starting goalkeeper for best part of a decade um you know like he is the sort of surest thing on the market for a good premier league club how much um, did chelsea and, sign robert sanchez for last summer was that 18 and he's almost immediately they were like oh we don't want him um i mean so much this 25 time, million 25, 25. Million. Yeah, there you go. I mean that that I know that you can only sort of set the market set by more than just what other players are going for, but Arsenal could be pointing at that and saying well, we need well over thirty. Yeah, James um, Trafford with twenty million to Burnley. I mean, yeah, there is I mean, no justifiable reason not to get at least your money. I mean, just losing money on Aaron Ramsdale would just seem so remarkable, considering the goalkeeper he's turned into since he's joined mm. Arsenal. His age, his contract length, he's an established in England international. It was like you said the 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 message it would send out. I think if you accept a cut price fee for him, and a club that's already considered awful sellers and pushovers when it comes to negotiating transfer fees for, if you're selling Aaron Ramsdale at a cut price fee, I just think it's, I just think it's terrible. I, I really do. I just don't see as well. I, I was I mentioned this earlier. I saw um, James Pierce at the Athletic was he put out a tweet the other day saying that Liverpool were valuing you know, Seth Vandenberg, that young defender they've got. They yeah. value. They want. They want twenty million for him, and I was thinking, if Liverpool get twenty million for Seth Vandenberg and Arsenal sell Aaron Ramsdale for fifteen million, can you just genuinely imagine. I mean, how on earth does that even work? And and, and I think that has to be uh, relayed to Ramsdale quite early on, if he's not already aware of it, which I'm sure he is. That like, look, Arsenal can't be a charity. Well, if you sell him for fifty yeah. million, you're going to have to spend that money to replace him on a new goalkeeper. Exactly. You're going to be getting a worse goalkeeper, no doubt about it. I'm convinced. And Aaron Ramsdale, so you just keep him at that point, don't you? Even if yeah. it's sad for Aaron Ramsdale from an Arsenal point of view, you're basically spending, you know, you're breaking even and getting a worse goalkeeper. You're in a worse position than you were at the start of the window. So it makes no sense to me. Yeah, um, I know what we said before that that you may end up the, the market in terms of just pure number of clubs that. A player of Ramsdale's quality would consider as well may not be huge, but you know, you don't, you, you don't like you, you know he he's on an employment contract that he signed. Like you know, yeah. if he if he doesn't get his move, he's gonna have to suck it up. Um, yeah. And I, I I think Arsenal would be prepared to do that. This isn't the sort of Arsenal of Arsene Wenger's year where the head can, the heart can sometimes rule the head. It, mm -hmm. It's just not the case. And yeah. If he and David Raya are Arsenal's two goalkeepers at the start of the season, well, you wouldn't be too worried about that, would you? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Right, we're already up to nearly 55 minutes, so we're going, we've are going. we gone about 10 minutes over what we were talking Oof. about before, before we started recording. But I do have a couple of questions that I'm going to have to get to because I did ask people to put in some questions. That's so damn. A bit of an extended one. I e, but Oh, no, sorry, Samuel, he says at the bottom there. Samuel from Nigeria. I always love it when someone actually signs off with their real name at the bottom. It makes it so much easier. Thank you, Samuel. From Nigeria, say so, hi, Charles and Ben. People love calling you Benj rather than James. It's right. so strange. It's ever since well, I, I do to... it, to be fair. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's something natural about it. I don't know yeah. what it is. 
Hi, Charles and Benj. First of all, I'd like to keep Party at the club at least for one more year because he's really good when fit. I know his fitness can't be guaranteed, but what what if he does stay fit? What do you guys think? Secondly, I think if we push, we could get De Jong and that would transform the team. I know that you're very much of oh, yeah. that uh, of that mindset, James. Thirdly, I think we should get another defender too. Saliba racked up so many minutes last season, it would be detrimental to both the player and the team if he gets injured. I really think we should get a proper number nine. It would be vital, as Jesus can play on the wing. So basically a new spine of the team or spine of the squad, <laughs> adding more sp- uh, the spine to the squad. Um, in terms of Thomas Partey, we, we kind of briefly spoke about it now. In the situation that Arsenal are in with Thomas Partey now, what would you do for him? Would you... If say, if no if no bids arrive for Thomas Partey, Obviously, I don't. There's no way Arsenal give Thomas Partey a new contract. I just, I just cannot see there's any way that that's going to happen. So it's either you accept a real cut price fee to try and get him and his way, his wages off the books for this season, or do, do you keep him and hope he can stay fit? And then you've got, you know, a very clearly still very talented, good player that you can call upon for one more year, and then you just let him leave on a free at the end of the end of the summer. How do you sort of see things with Thomas Partey, or what what do you think should happen when it comes to Thomas this summer? I mean. I think if you get any offer that sort of gets the wages off the books, what even if it's be, though, what low... it be? I talked about this today and I said my valuation for him, again, which lots of people disagreed with, but my valuation for him was sort of 10, 10 million. Do you think less than that? Less. Who is Who are the clubs that are paying big money for a 30-year-old who, who can't who just can't it's not proving they can stay fit um well if casemiro goes to saudi arabia this summer how much how much are they going to spend on casemiro very little in terms of transfer fee really okay <laughs> it's just not the saudi business model and a lot of this saudi stuff is is being uh, uh is, the, the indications i've got is it's more driven by agents at the moment than it is by clubs mm-hmm. and um i'm not aware i like as far as i'm aware there's no club that's come forward with with interest to arsenal on Thomas Partey. And I don't think that would change until late in the window where clubs are sort of saying, well, we do need someone to fill a DM shaped hole. I think Thomas Partey is a really good footballer, but um, I, if I were a director of football of a club, I would not be sort of investing big money early in the window in someone that I didn't feel confident could play 35 games a season. So do, the I wage, I do the wages matter that much for Arsenal then? Would you not just keep him then? Uh, and and have him available. If I've, if I've signed the sort of if I've signed the six, let's say it's De Jong, Bruno, Gimaraish, whatever, then I think I suppose there's a logic to just saving the money okay. because you'd then have Bruno. Sorry, new six. Not saying Bruno <laughs> New six, uh, Rice, Jorginho to cover that position. Yeah, I think then you just make the argument of like, well, might as well save some money because um, every penny counts, but. Obviously, if you haven't secured a new midfielder, then you, you keep him. And I don't think it would be the end of the world to keep him from from a footballing perspective. No, I don't think it'd be the end of the world at all. But obviously, you're hoping he's fit for that final year of his contract. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, I could, I, I'm interested in your. You think less than ten million for Thomas? He's only thirty. It's not old. If the Saudi old, clubs, this, if this, but, but bear, I mean, so the new Saudi rules are really like focused around getting younger talent in. And that's what they would like to do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if the Saudi clubs come in, you can obviously push that number a bit higher. But Al Nasser and Al Al Hilal are not massively in the parte business. Yeah. Okay. At the moment. Yeah. Right. Um, here's one from Pat. He says, "Hi, Charles and James. Great show as always. But academy players, um, which academy players we promote to the first team squad next season? Also, I see we are looking at signing young players like Mason Millier and uh, Sidak O'Neill." Did you like that pronunciation? Yeah, well uh, done. We did check that beforehand. So young we tried. signed from Wolves. Is this the way forward in the future? Yeah, I mean, it's we've spoken about this before, isn't it? That Arsenal are making a a big push to actually sort of add some new players to their youth ranks this summer. It's something they haven't done in the last couple of years, and they are actively trying to do that this summer and bring in bringing in some players just to refresh things and um and they're really just trying to make a big go at you know becoming a bit of a force when it comes to youth football game, which I do think is quite important for them to do. Um, in terms of who. I mean, do you see anyone really being promoted to the first team squad other than potentially Ethan this, this summer? I don't, I don't really see anyone. Do you? Ethan was going to be the one I said. I yeah. uh, wonder if what we're looking at here is maybe Arteta's sort of Phil Foden that gets really quite slowly blooded in yeah. you know, a game here. Maybe next season he gets 
three or four games, maybe one start in the early rounds of the EFL Cup. Um, but like you, you get, said, with you get rid of a, a Vieira or a Smith Rowe, you think of the minutes mm-hmm. that those two have played this season, and you give those minutes to Ethan instead. You know, because it's not huge amounts of minutes, is it for, no. for Emil? I mean, it's what he played hundred. about twenty games, fifteen to twenty games, didn't he? But appearances, but only a couple of starts in there, and the minutes weren't weren't massive. And I think that's what you're looking at with Ethan this coming season, don't you? Just in and out of the team, just a handful of minutes here and there, just to because he's still so young. I mean, is he? He's seventeen now, isn't he? Just turned seventeen, yeah. is that right? Just turned yeah. seventeen. He's still so young, so he's not going to come in and suddenly play loads. But I think if you can say if a Vieira goes or Emil more likely goes, then do you don't really want to replace Emil, do you? I think because then you're blocking. Mm-hmm. I think Ethan's the guy to take those minutes to come into the squad and maybe take those Emil minutes, isn't he? Yeah, exactly. I mean, just for context, those Emil minutes this season were 350. Exactly. I mean, that's and almost yeah. all of them off the bench. Quite often. You know, quite often the sort of minutes that serve no purpose for Smith Rowe. Like we don't need to know how Smith Rowe performs when Arsenal are four 0 up against mm. West Ham. But actually, I thought there was value to seeing how Ethan Ranieri performed in that in that scenario. So yeah. he he would be the one, I guess. Um, and I think people maybe need to recalibrate the brain their brain around the idea that you're talking <clears throat> one every three or four years rather than you know past Arsenal teams where it was two or three a year might have been possible some years. It's just not going to happen when the standards are this high. No, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Right. Nice one, mate. Hit the hour mark today. First time we've done Oof. that for a while. Um, so yeah, apologies for dragging it on a little bit, you guys. But I hope you've all enjoyed the show. If you've been watching or listening, we'll be back again next week to do it all over again. I'll be back in the morning to my usual daily shows to keep your eyes peeled for that anything you want me to discuss in that show you know what to do get into the comments and let me know james thank you very much mate enjoy wembley this weekend i hope you have a fantastic game to watch um yeah real madrid i agree i think they're going to end up with that trophy in their hands once again have a good one mate thanks for joining me i'll speak to you next week thank you bye-bye